Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome back to the webinar series. We see lots of familiar faces who have been following us along. Fantastic to have you back. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Haley, and I work with the Columbia Mountains Institute. And, and I'm here to welcome you along with Kendall Banesh with the Kootenai Conservation Program. And um, as many of you know, we have joined forces uh, bringing the CRUD talks as uh, the Columbia River Ecological Discussions and the KCP's Winter Webinar Series together into one. And um, we've got a treat for you today, a pretty fun dynamic crew um, who are going to delve deeply into what it's like managing fire on the landscape. Um, let me just advance my slide here. So, as you can see, we have seven speakers uh, in this series, and um, they're going to be speaking to the theme of foundations of resilience, understanding departures from historical ecosystems, and adapting for resilient futures. These speakers will be presenting, or sorry, drawing on patterns from the past, challenges from the present, and scenarios from the future to explore adapting to ecosystems for resilience in the Columbia Basin. We're partway through the series now. And we have, we want to give our thanks to the Columbia Basin Trust who helped to get this up and off the ground. Many thanks to the trust for your support. Um, and as I said, we have four speakers uh, to welcome today. Robert Gray, Colleen Ross, Kaya Allen, and Dr. Carly Phillips. And I'll introduce them in more detail in just a moment. Um, now, before I do that, I just want to pause as, as is important and as has been our routine. Um, to acknowledge the land that I broadcast from today. Uh, myself personally, I'm in Revelstoke, BC, on the unceded homeland of the Sinaiic people. The Shaquapum people have also stewarded this land for millennia. The Tanaha call this valley the land of the Chickadee in their creation story, and the Okanagan Nation Alliance also expressed strong connections to this place. And what I would like to do now is invite you to do the same. So please open up your chat a great opportunity to test out your chat because I think you might be using it later on and introduce yourself, share your name, perhaps who you are working with and also um, the land, the land territory acknowledgement that you're zooming in from today. And as those acknowledgements flow in, I'm just going to try to keep us on time and keep on trucking here. So what I would like to do is briefly talk about the Columbia Mountains Institute. So we are one of your host organizations today. And um, who are we? So we're a nonprofit organization and an association of people uh, working in the various fields of ecology. Our home range is Southern British Columbia, Canada, and our membership extends across BC and into Alberta, into the Yukon and Northwest Territories. One of the main things that we do is provide professional development opportunities. And those come in a number of forms, such as conferences, courses, workshops, and of course, webinars. Um, we address everything from skill-based research techniques to more complex uh, land management conundrums. And our website, of course, is the best place to learn a little bit more about what we do and um, contains a bunch of great resources, such as proceeding documents from um, all of our larger events and, and talk recordings, of course, from this series and others. So I encourage you to go there. It's at cmiae.org. Um, or reach out to me if you have any questions about CMI and how you might want to be involved or suggestions for how we might support your work. So what I'd like to do now is pass you over to Kendall Banesh with the Kootenai Conservation Program. Thank you, Haley. My name is Kendall Banesh and I'm joining you on behalf of Kootenai Conservation Program or KCP. KCP's work occurs in the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Tanaha, Shikwetmik, Sinaiks and Silks Okanagan peoples who've lived here and cared for the land, water and wildlife since time immemorial. We're a broad partnership of 85 land and water conservation and stewardship groups, indigenous nations, government agencies, resource industries and agricultural producers working throughout the East and West Kootenays. Our mandate is to coordinate and facilitate conservation efforts on private land and to generate the support and resources needed to maintain this effort which includes building technical knowledge in webinars like this. We're very excited to be hosting this webinar series with CMI and would like to give an additional thanks to our program sponsors about whom or without whom we would not be able to support this type of amazing work. 
So just a couple of housekeeping details from me and then we'll get started. As you've noticed, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted to the event webpage within a week. And we ask that you all remain muted unless you're asking a question during the Q&A at the end of the talk. So please note that we'll be using the chat function for our Q&A. So you're welcome to add in questions into the chat at any time during the webinar, but we won't be addressing these questions until the end of the talk. And that's it from me. So back to you, Haley. Great, thank you. All right, okay, so now what you've all been waiting for. Okay, let's um, introduce our speakers. Robert Gray, Colleen Ross, Kaya Allen, and Dr. Carly Phillips. It was really fun seeing this come together. It was this really quick and organic process, I would say, from my perspective anyways, and, um, and I'm quite excited. So they're gonna be presenting a talk titled, Reintroducing Fire as a Process, Restoring Disrupted Fire Regimes Across Landscapes. And what I would like to do is just read uh, a couple, well, four short bios. So Robert is a certified wild, wildland fire ecologist with over 40 years experience in fire science and operations, including prescribed fire in Canada and the United States. Colleen is a burn boss and a wildland fire ecologist. She was drawn to the positive benefits of prescribed fire at a young age and is eager to continue learning and sharing the art and science behind prescribed fire. Kaya is currently a unit crew supervisor with the BC Wildlife, oh, sorry, Wildfire Service. And she's also a biologist specializing in ecosystem restoration and recovery as it pertains to wildlife disturbance and fire ecology. And we also have Carly, who is a researcher, uh, researcher in residence at the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions at the University of Victoria. She's interested in ecosystem ecology, climate change mitigation, and carbon, and carbon cycling. So we're going to pass it over to them. So I'll let Carly take over the screen share. Perfect. All set to go? All set. We can hear you. Great, thank you very much. And thank you so much to the organizers uh, and the opportunity to speak to everybody here. And thanks for everybody who's, I see we have 113 people sitting out there. So welcome you all. Um, we, take a, we took a look at the, uh, the outline for this series and thought that, okay, a big piece of this puzzle when it comes to resilience is those operational things that we can do. And certainly prescribed fire is a big part of that. So we pulled the team together because we're often used to working as a team and we've got this presentation for you. So I'm gonna lead off with an overview on prescribed fire planning. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Colleen who's gonna talk about once we have the planning done, we could move to operations. Key is gonna talk about the very important element of you know, converting our objectives into results and how do we determine how effective our burn has been through fire effects monitoring. And then Carly's gonna bring up the, uh, the end of the presentation and talk about that all important topic of carbon, you know, prescribed fire and carbon is a very important topic. So we'll move on to that the last. So next slide. We'll advance to the next one. So it's often, uh, I find it quite useful to develop kind of a decision tree when I, talk, when I talk about organizing things. So when we talk about prescribed fire planning decision tree, we start off with that kind of that bigger holistic picture of why are we doing a burn? Why are we contemplating applying fire to the landscape? And part of that is this ecological, social, and legal framework, uh, the different environments in which we have to you know, think about prescribed fire. And distilling out of that are likely to come a number of uh, objectives. And we can either have quantifiable objectives or qualitative objectives or both often. From that, once more, we distill down into the key elements of a prescribed fire plan. Next slide. At that larger scale, um, we're really interested in um, the decisions that lead to the use of fire. So, uh, and we can generate a number of questions to help us with that decision-making process. Is it part of a larger landscape strategy as one? So community wildfire resilience plans in Cranbrook and Kimberley, we apply fire that's part of our community wildfire resilience plans, the ER program in the trench. Uh, these new forest landscape plans that are being developed, prescribed fire will likely be a big part of those efforts as well. Is it ecologically appropriate to apply fire to this ecosystem that we're looking at managing? Um, did the ecosystem evolve with fire? And if it did, what was the fire regime and what type of fire severity? 
So the next question, how departed is the fire zone is important because you know, organisms have adapted to fire over a long period of time, but situation as far as forest structure and composition can change so that when we reapply fire, it's not the same severity. And those organisms aren't as well adapted to a, a shift in fire regimes. So it's important to understand how these ecosystems have changed over time and how fire effects may have changed with it. Um, are there other treatment strategies in lieu of fire or are preliminary treatments necessary before we can apply fire? This once again is this measure of departure. Do we need to do something first before we apply fire to get the desired effects? What are the consequences from the use of fire? Um, you know, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So we have to think about that when we use fire. Um, what's likely going to happen if we apply fire here? An example early in my career was we were burning in, uh, we were trying to improve elk habitat and we did a 50 hectare burn one year and we had 150 elk camp on it over the winter. We hadn't anticipated that consequence of drawing in wildlife called the succulent growth that comes in after prescribed fire. We realized that 50 hectares isn't enough when we have that large of a, a herbivore population in the area. So that's a direct consequence of the fire. So we have to be thinking about things as we do the planning. Um, is the use of prescribed fire aligned with existing legislation and laws? What's the legal framework for using prescribed fire? It may not be that you can't use it, but there may be certain limitations on its use. And what are the risks and are they manageable? And we do that, we understand that through, best <clears throat> through past practice as well as through peer review. And we try to understand what those risks are. Um, we're trying to develop what's basically called a high reliability organization. And that's where we try to anticipate and resolve all risk, knowing that we're never gonna be entirely successful but we have to do the best job we can. Next slide. So the next key part of this is the actual burn objectives and a really useful acronym is SMART. Are the objectives specific? Are they measurable? Are they achievable? Are they relevant? And are they time bound? Just basically timing restrictions on things. So when we use prescribed fire, um, we are trying to achieve ecological and or cultural objectives. And I see your next speaker coming up is, is Joe Gilchrist and he can speak at length about the cultural use of fire. We are intending to use fire to meet ecological objectives. We, we're, we're basically using fire to, to get certain fire effects. We don't apply fire to put smoke in the air or make it all black or spend the money. It's all about trying to achieve certain fire effects at the end of the day. And in the process, we have to consider many, many factors um, based on the objectives, how constraining is the burn window? Um, how often do we get actual good burning conditions throughout a year? Is it five days a year or is it once every five years? That's very, very important when it comes to actually planning a prescribed fire and prioritizing where we're gonna be applying prescribed fire. Are the resources available to assist with the burn? Um, in some places, we may have to build that resource capacity. We don't currently have it. Um, does the burn window align with the funding sources? Um, that's a problem that we, we struggle with all the time with oftentimes our grants are one or two years in time and we may not get a burn window over two year time period. So it's important to understand the limitations of that. Is there public support for the burn? Do we have social license to conduct a prescribed burn? We've been very, very careful and diligent um, all the different players in the southeast part of BC because we do engage a lot with the public and we want the public support to continue applying prescribed fire. Is there a timing or a temporal constraint, um, i.e. is it other seasonal wildlife constraints? Are there nesting birds in the area? Um, are there vegetation conditions we need to be concerned about? Next slide. So once we've, once we've developed this list of objectives, um, then we can start to build our plan. So that first part is, is those quantifiable or qualitative objectives. Um, to meet those objectives, we have to look seriously at the fire weather and develop our prescription window. Under these conditions, we can conduct a prescribed burn. And it's not just fire weather, it's also fuel moisture and fuel conditions. We're trying to achieve certain, we wanna, we wanna generate certain fire behavior in order to basically meet these objectives. So the predicted fire behavior is a big part of the burn plan. And we state 
usually a range of conditions that are acceptable to meet these objectives. The ignition plan is also important. How do we apply fire to meet the objectives through specific ranges of fire behavior? Holding is another big part of it as well. Um, we're, we're opening the bottle. We're gonna let genie out of the bottle and we have to be able to put the genie back in the bottle. So we have to have the resources at hand to make sure that the burn stays within the prescribed area. A prescribed fire is not only prescribed objectives, but it's also spatially very explicit. We are applying fire for these reasons to this specific piece of ground. It doesn't mean generally over here, it means over here explicitly. So we wanna have the resources at hand and enough resources that we can keep the burn inside the unit and we can contend with you know, an escape if we do have one. Uh, mop up and patrol is important. We wanna be able to put this thing out under a certain period of time. We don't want it lingering out there. Um, contingency, what do we do in the event of a protracted escape? The wind kicked up, something happened that we hadn't anticipated. We have to have the resources at hand to corral this thing, get under control as quickly as possible. In some places, we need a traffic plan. We're, when we're burning you know, in Kimberley or in Cranbrook, um, in the WUI, we have to control traffic. And so the traffic plan is also part of the burn plan. Next slide. Additional elements of the burn organization, who is doing what, who has responsibilities for certain um, actions. Smoke management is a very big component of this thing. So we have to understand what are the implications of smoke? How much smoke are we gonna generate? Where is it going to go? What are the impacts downstream for not just the day of the burn, but for a couple of days afterward? Um, safety, basic site safety. What are the hazards on the site? Um, how do we respond to a, a, an injury, an event like that on a burn? Uh, and public safety, control the public access, road safety. Um, how long do the public need to stay out of an area? Um, all those things are really critical um, to include in a plan. Communications, not just operationally on burn day, but also notifying the public, um, keeping the public well informed of what's going on. And finally, the monitoring plan. How do we assess cause and effect? How do we assess whether what we did met our objectives? So it's really important to have this monitoring component and Kia is gonna talk about that after Colleen. So Colleen. Hi there. Great, thanks Bob. So here we're gonna talk about burn operations. What will happen is a plan is given, it's created, it's been approved by all the interested groups, and it's ready to go and to be brought to fruition. So I'm going to explain a little bit in not a lot of detail. We're going to stay high level here because it can get really, I could get into the weeds. And we don't want to go there. We're very time bound here into burning operations on burn day and how we're going to make a successful uh, burning operation day based on the plan that has been written. There's many roles on a burn day. Everything from putting out those road, road signs, getting a burn registration number, uh, making sure there's pizza for dinner. And this presentation is just gonna focus on some key ones, not all of them. Next. So in British Columbia, we follow the incident command structure when it comes to burn day. And the burn boss is the person in charge or at the top of that organizational chart. So it's equivalent to an incident commander. And each position under the burn boss will report to them. You move up that chain of command. So the burn boss is responsible for everybody underneath them in that org chart. If you want to dive into the details of what and who exactly works, what resources and who works on a burn plant and a burn day. You can go to BC Wildfire Service. They have a great site explaining some of that, Fire Smart Canada. And if you really wanna get into the tasks, the National Wildfire Coordination Group of the United States has some very good task books linked to each of these ones, each of these sections to explain exactly what they're doing. Next. So let's start with the burn box. So, they're the ones in charge on bird day. They're the ones responsible for everything that happens and making sure that it's successful and everything's safe. So this position, in my opinion, and a lot, a lot of this is gonna be based upon my experiences from both sides of the border, the US and Canada, 
This position starts well in advance of burn day. You're getting to know the burn plan. You're developing relationships with the burn team to build that trust and understanding who everybody is and what their capabilities are. You're getting to know the unit, where the challenges are, where um, different pinch points could be, where you can cut things off, understanding the fuels, understanding the, the fuels around the unit. They have to be highly experienced and they need to understand the roles that they are supervising, the firing techniques, the fire behavior. They're responsible for making sure everything is smooth and goes well on burn day, from the pumps and hoses working to the conditions being ready and present. Um, I'll go out and I'll put my fingers in the soil and, and crack sticks and just get to know that unit. So we're all acting like coiled springs when it comes to burning operations. So then when it's time to go, the burn boss feels comfortable that it's time to go. They're doing pre-weather and pre-fire behavior, getting to know uh, the current and expected fire weather behavior conditions, and just making sure that the information in that burn plan that's given to them will be implemented successfully. Okay, next. Now, I know you can't read the detail on this piece of paper that's in front of you right here, but that's okay. That's not what it's about. You can go to the BC Wildfire Service site and look up no go, go, no go checklist. And that's what I have presented here. This is a due diligence piece that is filled out just prior to burning operations to make sure the burn boss is covering everything that needs to be covered to justify being able to put fire on the ground. And some of the things included in the, the go, no-go checklist are smoke management prescription specifications, uh, the requirements of the resources, are they certified, are they qualified, and making sure that uh, all the resources are there for containment and adequate um, containment and potential for escapes. Next. The next key position is the firing boss. The firing boss is reporting to the burn boss and they're in charge of exactly as it sounds, firing and ignition operations. So we won't get into firing techniques or patterns here, but a firing boss really needs to understand the different techniques, the different patterns that can be used in ignition operations and the different resources and firing resources that can be used and ignition resources that can be used on burn day to meet the goals and objectives of the burn plan. They should have experience in all of that, as well as the fire behavior on top of that. They are always one step ahead. They're thinking about changing their patterns, changing the techniques based on the current and expected fire weather and behavior so that the we stay in prescription and that the fire effects that's desired in the burn plan and those objectives are being met. They work very closely with the holding boss. These two are very tight because your firing can only be as um, move along as quickly as your holding is able to contain everything safely. So now onto the holding boss. I like to call the holding boss the goalie in a way. Like this, this is such an important position. And so they are really dictating to the firing boss their movement and where they can go next because you do not want your firing to get ahead of what you're capable of holding. Well, that makes sense. But a holding boss, again, their job starts well in advance. They're making sure contingency makes sense, their, the guards make sense, their, their equipment is in working order, the pumps and hoses are in working order, their people meet the expectations for firefighting. This person in holding boss position, they should have a good fire fighting background and fire suppression background. They also need to understand the contingency plan and like the burn boss and the firing boss are also many steps ahead of everybody else thinking, what if the fire were to go here? What if it were to go here? How are we going to react? How are we going to fight it over here? And ready to implement the contingency plan if needed. Next. So again, a very important job. And I often tell people who are just starting out in prescribed fire or want to learn more about prescribed fire, this is a very good section to start under because you hear and see everything. 
as well as you understand the importance of this role and and how and how really at the end of the day they're the ones dictating the movement and the progress of the burn on burn day. Next. So the fire behavior specialist or fire behavior and fire effects monitoring is a position on burn day that is very important for documentation documentation and check-ins to let us know what we're doing is good. You might see this role labeled as fire effects monitor, fire behavior specialist, or fire behavior analyst. And what they do is they gather current weather and fire behavior. They're looking at things like flame length and rate of spread, temperature, relative humidity, and the winds. And they're reading that out across on the radio um, for the whole burn team. So they can hear what is the fire doing? Are we staying in prescription? Are we meeting the prescription? Do we need to increase our rate of spread? Are we meeting our desired fire effects? And are we meeting the, are, are we going to meet the objectives? They're looking at smoke, smoke patterns, and they're taking pictures and videos. And all of this information will be used. Next. All this information is gathered and used and given for improvement in burn plan development, as well as for the long-term fire effects monitoring that Kia will be getting into in the next presentation after this. So a very important job, very needed, very dorky. It's definitely my favorite position next to burn boss on, on, the, on the burn. It's, um, it's a very critical job and you need somebody that understands fire behavior as well as can assess challenges that might be happening. Uh, they need to have the confidence to be able to call out wind gusts or uh, know the clouds so they can tell a story that could be coming, a convective buildup that could bring gusts, things like that. So very experienced person in fire weather and fire behavior should fill that position. Next. So now we have our burn team in place. That org chart was very simplified. There's There could be up to 20, 50 boxes on that on that org chart, but I simplified it. When everybody's in place, the burn boss does a safety briefing and talks about why we're here and what we plan on achieving, what to look for, et cetera, the communications, all those things that go into the burn plan that Bob laid out for us. And then we do what's called a test fire. So this is it, it comes down to this. This is, this is where my heart speeds up on burn day because I am really hoping and crossing my fingers that everything I thought about as a burn boss leading up to now is going to be successful. A test fire is exactly as it sounds. We are setting a fire to test to see if the conditions are good to stay in prescription and meet our objectives and fire effects that we want. How big is a test fire? It's as big as you need it to be for you to be able to come to a conclusion. Are you going to burn or not burn? And it is really heartbreaking because sometimes you have to say, you can't do it. And you need to say and be honest when you cannot continue firing operations. If you're not going to meet your objectives, you're not going to meet your desired fire effects or your fire behavior or stay or stay within prescription, there's no point in doing your burn. Just to make it black could have negative impacts for the future. But again, if you're not comfortable with it, you need to discuss that with your burn team or the client or the person who wrote the burn plan and say, we may not be able to meet all the objectives. We can meet some of these. You could come back in two or three years to cover the next one. But this, this is the final decision, whether you're gonna go or not go. And it's the last thing on the go, no go checklist to see if we can keep going. So test fire, it looks good. Next. So we'll keep going. Everybody comes together, they know their positions, they know their places, they recce the burn ahead of time. We've done all of our relationship building, our public engagement, everybody's in place and we bring it all together. The idea is, again, meeting the fire effects, meeting the prescription, meeting the objectives, having a successful burn day, doing an after action review over that pizza that we ordered for dinner, so waiting back at the staging area, and then evolving that into future burns in, in, in the area. Thank you. All right, thanks, Colleen. 
So as been alluded to, I'm going to be talking to you all about fire effects monitoring. So fire effects are really the bread and butter of prescribed fire for fire ecologists and fire scientists. And although ecosystems have co-evolved with fire, as we all know, burning under different conditions are, is going to lead to different effects from the fire on the environment. And it's also going to affect the success of the burn as it relates to overall prescription objectives. So let's get into it a little bit uh, next. So what do we mean by fire effects? A broad definition is the physical, biological, and ecological impacts of fire on the environment. So that's talking about the interaction between heat, severity, and intensity, and the properties of the ecosystem components. What this definition doesn't include are the social aspects of fire effects. So there is also um, the social license to burn, how does the community feel after the burn is completed? How do the fire practitioners feel? So there's a biological aspect and a social aspect to fire effects. Next. Importantly, it's good to define a few terms that are commonly used by fire practitioners and sometimes they're used interchangeably. So there is a difference between fire intensity and fire severity. Um, fire intensity is the energy released by a fire. So um, typically, you're going to see that explained in kilowatts per meter or some sort of um, uh, form like that. And then fire severity is really how that fire intensity is affecting the ecosystem. So we're talking about the loss or change of organic matter above ground and below ground. So you might be able to look at the size of twig diameter that's being consumed or how uh, the depth of duff layer that's being consumed, things like that. And then burn severity is specifically talking about the consumption from fire. Next. It's also important to talk about ecosystem response. So uh, in fire effects, we're often talking about how eco ecosystem processes are going to be altered by fire. So that's talking about regeneration and colonization. And those are related to fire intensity and severity. And so we want to use different ways to measure fire effects in order to look at these ecosystem processes and the ecosystem response. Next. So fire can have effects on a number of different things. This list is certainly non-exhaustive. Um, anything that you can really think of that might uh, have an effect in terms of the ecosystem but also socially, so air quality, um, smoke management is also an effect, your visibility, your air traffic, if you're close to an airport, and those social qualities that I mentioned before. And so there's a huge amount of fire effects that can be included in order to be monitored in any given plan. Next. So how do we measure these fire effects? <clears throat> well, as there is a very large list of potential fire effects. There's also many ways that they can be monitored. However, this is going to change temporally and in space. So you're going to want to get your baseline measurements done depending on what you're measuring. So those can look like fuel moisture readings, fuel loading transects, vegetation plots. And then as Colleen had mentioned, there's additional data that's going to be collected during the burn as well. So those weather readings, those fire behavior observations, there's other um, observations you can take. So you can measure soil heat and things like that. And then measurements are also going to be wanted, you're going to want to take after the burn. So typically measurements will be wanted to be taken immediately after the burn. Um, and then also in some sort of longer monitoring time scale. It's also important to mention that there are different scales to measuring fire effects. So sometimes it's small scale and we're looking at small units. And then sometimes we're looking at larger landscape level uh, measurements. So we're using remote sensing and things like that to take these measurements. Next. So <clears throat> when we're, as I mentioned, when we're monitoring fire effects, then we're going to need repeated sampling and temporal variation in sampling. So this should be incorporated into the burn planning and the monitoring from the beginning. And that way, fire practitioners 
can ensure that this data is collected and that we have a plan to make a longer term data set if that's necessary. Next. So how does this relate to prescribed fire management? So as I mentioned, um, fire effects monitoring is really how we figure out whether or not we've met the goals of the prescription of the prescribed burn. So in that burn, we're gonna be able to set different parameters for, di for different variables, which are gonna affect outcomes. Um, so we can define specific fuel moisture levels and um, we can also determine seasonality different things like that, depending on the variable that you're looking at. Um, these are really part of an adaptive landscape management plan. So fire effects monitoring is an iterative, iterative process. We're looking at taking measurements and feeding that back into our planning process in order to be able to inform further management planning and also to be able to um, inform our next burn or determine if we need to take more measurements somewhere else. So the system gathers data information needed for fire management. It assesses ecosystem damage and benefits as well as social effects. And it evaluates the success or failure of that burn. So in this way, we're able to really get a good data set and take a look at the management actions that we're taking and inform our management moving forward in order to take the best next steps. So thanks with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Carly. Thanks so much, Kia. Hi, everyone. I'm Carly Phillips. Um, thank you to the organizers. I'm looking forward to talking with you all today. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the relationship between prescribed fire and carbon emissions, not just in the sense of the emissions that are released from prescribed fire, but how those fit into the larger context of climate change um, and our ability to shape and create resilient forests in light of that. And so this is a figure Oh, of course, during my presentation, the slides won't advance. Here we go. Great. This is an image that was taken from um, a paper that Jen Barron led, who's at UBC and who spoke um, during this series last week, that's showing the extent of disruption of fire regimes. Because when we're thinking about prescribed burning, it's often about um, trying to reinstate uh, a more historically aligned fire regime. Um, that looks closer to what would have happened in the past. And on top of th those conditions are climate change. So we have this disrupted fire regime, and then we also have climate change on top of that. Um, so not only have we lost the landscape mosaic um, and have higher fuel loads as a result of um, fire suppression and colonization, but we also have climate change that's drying out um, via drought and higher temperatures, the fuel that's on the ground. And layered on top of that is mountain pine beetle, which again is creating essentially tinder in our forests. Um, and we know that wildfires are increasing in size um, and that they're increasing in burned area every year. So this is a study um, that came out last year. And what you're looking at here is burn area in percent per year on the y-axis and year on the x-axis. And each of the different lines is showing different climate change scenarios um, where green is the least amount of temperature increase and red is the most. And so regardless of what scenario we're in, we can see that burned area um, is projected to increase. And, and we know that with that, there come certain impacts and fire effects like Kia was just talking about. And those are going to be really important in determining the extent of carbon emissions that are coming from any given fire. And so let's let's take these um, higher severity fires um, that have become much more common under climate change um, and think about what the effects of those are. So this is a great graphic from CBC that really dives in um, to the way that high intensity and high severity fires impact an ecosystem. So you can see here on the left side that we've got a crown fire that has moved into the canopy. It's burning soil, it's burning vegetation, and all of that translates to not just carbon dioxide release, but also methane, nitrous oxide, and other more potent greenhouse gases. Following that fire, you have a potentially, and again, there's, there's variation within this, you have a forest that's no longer um, 
potentially going to be able to regrow or maybe um, regrowing after a longer period of time. You have hydrophobic soil. So there could be consequences for water quality. There could be an uh, increased risk of um, landslides and mudslides, that kind of thing. And so you have these really damaging effects. And from a carbon perspective, the carbon that was released as part of this high intensity fire may not be taken up again um, for another century or so, let's say. And in a lot of ecosystems um, in southern British Columbia, the ecosystems did not evolve with these high intensity fires. And so when these happen, they're a real departure, as Bob was discussing, from the fire regime of the past. Now, if we compare that to something like a low intensity fire, which although not always the case, um, is often the type of fire that prescribed burns are imitating, you can see that it's not killing trees. It's not going to burn fully into the duff and into the forest floor. And while there is some carbon dioxide release and other greenhouse gas release, it's not nearly of the same magnitude as what you might see in the high intensity fire. And then following that fire, you're going to see carbon storage over time. You're going to see carbon sequestration. Um, and there are uh, different and potentially from a human perspective, uh, more positive consequences of that fire. And these fires, these low intensity fires are also going to be releasing fewer emissions when compared to higher severity and higher intensity fires. And so to put those ideas into context, we can look at the actual emissions from wildfires in British Columbia. So what you're looking at here is you have total emissions in megatons of CO2 equivalent on the y-axis and you have year on the x-axis. The green line that's fairly straight there in the middle is total human-caused anthropogenic um, greenhouse gas emissions in BC and then the highly variable line is wildfire emissions. And the big takeaway from my perspective of this figure is that wildfire emissions are highly variable and they are increasing. In 2017 and 2018, wildfires in BC released three times more greenhouse gas emissions than all other sectors combined. So they're actually, wildfire emissions are actually dwarfing um, the emissions from other sectors. So regardless of how much we are reducing our emissions, which is how we're going to um, combat climate change, wildfires are kind of throwing that balance off in terms of what might be achievable um, when it comes to emission reductions. And that's kind of where prescribed fire comes in because forests have an important part to play in the fight against climate change. We're trying to, as a global community, limit warming to one and a half degrees Celsius um, over the next century. And it requires that we reach net negative emissions. So not only are we um, not releasing more carbon, but that there's active removal of carbon from the atmosphere. And forests are already doing that. They're already removing about 30% of fossil fuel emissions. But we also know, as I mentioned at the beginning, that these forests are in this state of a disrupted fire regime. And so the forests are holding more carbon than they have historically. And all of that carbon is at risk of getting released in these large high severity and high intensity fires that release huge amounts of carbon to the atmosphere. But we know that forests are going to be part of climate change solutions. And if we're thinking about how we might get there, if we go back to this figure, you can see that wildfires are jeopardizing our ability to meet these climate targets. And so in thinking about how prescribed fire could be part of these solutions, it's good to look at studies that have done these kinds of comparisons between high intensity, high severity um, wildfires and lower intensity um, prescribed burns that might be able to offset um, some of those emissions. And so in thinking about this, this is a study from Crofcheck that came out in 2017 that was simulating different fire um, weather conditions and how um, areas of forest, and this was done in the Sierra Nevada, are would respond and the emissions that would come from different combinations of forest management um, and wildfire. And so a couple of things to point out. 
on the x-axis, you've got your cumulative fire flux, you've got your emissions. And it's important to note that on the figure in the left-hand side that's showing contemporary fire weather, that goes from zero to four. And on the right-hand figure, the y-axis goes from zero to 40, so an order of magnitude difference. And so what we can see and what they modeled as part of this study was that in contemporary fire weather, they're seeing that there's not necessarily the payoff of prescribed burns when it comes to emissions, that the emissions um, from the maintenance fires, the prescribed fires, um, dwarfing the emissions from areas um, that were not burned. But when we look at the extreme fire weather, which is what we're seeing more and more frequently with climate change, we see that the emissions from those um, management activities are far less than the emissions that are coming off of um, wildfires in areas that were not managed with fire. And so what that shows me in this modeling exercise is that the upfront costs of doing um, these prescribed burns are going to pay dividends in this future climate where wildfires are projected to release even more carbon um, as, as they burn. And there are other benefits that go along with this too. There are benefits, this is a figure from um, Scott Stevens' work at Berkeley. And what he has shown in parts of the Sierra Nevada as well is that not only are there benefits for ecosystem resilience, there's benefits to water quality, there's benefits to biodiversity. And so actively managing landscapes is going to allow us to achieve that resilience that's going to be so important for climate change. From an emissions perspective, both in terms of limiting the, num the amount of wildfire emissions, but also in the capacity of forests to regrow and actively take carbon out of the atmosphere. And there are examples of this in place, in practice, um, elsewhere in the world. And so these are totally different systems as a caveat, but they present a, a way to think about this um, and the trade-offs between prescribed fire and wildfire when it comes to carbon emissions. And so in Australia, um, the Australian government has an emissions reduction fund. And one of the things um, that qualifies uh, for carbon credits as part of that is prescribed burning given the avoided emissions that that burning um, will avoid <laughs> if a wildfire were to burn through that same system. And so they're actually issuing carbon credits um, for this prescribed fire um, as a way to reduce emissions overall, which really illustrates uh, the utility of this when we're thinking about carbon and climate change. Um, and their relationship when it comes to natural ecosystems. And this is a place of active research. Um, both Bob and I are part of a project that's focused on British Columbia and trying to understand how we can manage forests using strategies like thinning and prescribed burning to not only reduce wildfire emissions, but enhance carbon sinks and create bioeconomic opportunities. And so this is, like I said, an active area of research um, where these ideas are being explored and we're learning more about the specifics of different ecosystem types and their capacity um, to absorb carbon um, and have reduced wildfire emissions as a result of different management strategies. And so in conclusion, we know that prescribed fires release carbon emissions, but these losses could be offset by reductions in future wildfire emissions. And we also know that there's a need for BC specific research that's underway to investigate the trade offs in the variety of variety of ecosystems um, that are part of BC. And finally, we know that forests are a part of climate change solutions and actively managing our forests using techniques like prescribed burning are an important part of maintaining that resilience and allowing them um, to be a full part of climate change solutions. Thank you. Well, that was great, you guys. Carly, that was an, an incredible conclusion. Thank you so much um, for all of you bouncing off of one another quite seamlessly. And um, yeah, sharing how all your pieces of your work fit um, so well together. There are, of course, a number of questions. Um, so let's launch into those. 
Um, for those of you who haven't posed a question yet, please feel free to add your question to the chat. If you would like to address your question to one person in particular, note as much. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to relay those questions to the speakers as they as they come in. Okay, so let's start with Jesse's question. She says, how have mid to high elevation projects managed in incidental takes of whitebark pine as a listed species at risk? I can't, I can't that. answer that. That's a good question for some of the uh, national parks folks who are actually um, doing ecosystem restoration and high elevation forests. Yeah, I might just have a comment that um, down this down in our region in the southeast, there are white bark pine, but I haven't personally seen um, there be an overlap with some of our higher elevation ecosystem restoration burns. But anytime there would be a referral would be heading to the correct person um, in habitat or in another area in order to make sure that we're doing our due diligence if there's any sort of an endangered species in a proposed burn. Okay, thanks Kia. Any other comments on that one? No, okay, thanks. Um, so our next question comes from John and he says, do you have any preference regarding season of burn, fall versus spring burning and what constraints define which season you choose? Sure, that's a, sure there's a lot in that question. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it really depends on first what you're trying to achieve. And first that's the, like, Bob went through that, so I don't know, Bob, you want to talk about that because it's mostly your presentation, but it's, you have these higher level goals and within those goals, you have objectives and in those objectives, you're going to find the desired fire effects that you want to meet those objectives and then create this prescription to <clears throat> meet those. And it could be spring, it could be fall. And a lot of that goes into um, running the fire behavior, running the models, talking to locals. Local knowledge is huge when it comes to doing prescribed fire and trying to figure out the right fire, the right time of year to meet what you desire your end state. So it really, it depends. Um, it depends is a very common answer in prescribed fire. And I hope I don't use it a lot at the rest of the time, but I'm just going to warn you. <laughs> but that's a good question. Um, anybody else have anything to add? Um, I've just come across the preference for different seasons of burning, depending on the area, so it depends, um, around wildfire risk. So some, uh, you know, municipalities or nations are adverse to burning at one time of the year or the other, just due to local knowledge around wildfire risk, and that'll be something that um, would be incorporated in the burn plan. Is nodding. All right. Thanks, you guys. Um, so our next question comes from Mandy. She says, do you change burn timing for desired outcomes? So for example, increased berry production, or is the focus of these burns mostly to control understory density in general? Uh, it really it still depends on what your objectives are. Um, timing so much, it's it's timing as it affects fire effects so um you know we talked about the different objectives that we have and and um we one of the first things we do is if it's if it's plant species specific then we we look to the research and local local knowledge and oftentimes it's indigenous knowledge about what is the fire ecology of those species and it's not just the species themselves but it's plants it's also the pollinators that are associated with those species so there's a lot that goes into understanding what's that, what's the relationship with fire. And oftentimes, as, as Kia mentioned, it's a temperature threshold relationship. So timing may, may have some relevance to it, um, but other conditions like um, soil moisture and soil temperature, uh, what are the fuels in the area that you're burning, at, you know, that are associated with the plant that you're interested in. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the question was, you know, um, what are some of the sort of common objectives that we have? And um, each burn is a little bit different. 
um, you know, I've, I've been burning for 40 years and yeah, oftentimes we have an objective to reduce the encroachment of, of conifers that are coming into a, a savanna type forest structure. We may be trying to keep trees alive or, but oftentimes it's, it's we're really kind of aiming for uh, the generation of, of higher levels of pyrodiversity is really the term that we're after. It's, it's all these species that are that are adapted to fire or have some kind of relationship to it. So timing is an element, but there's so many other pieces as Colleen mentioned, it's, it depends. Okay, thanks you guys. Um, <clears throat> so a question from Randy, will carbon sequestered by grasslands be considered part of the climate change mitigation strategy in BC? Carly, perhaps this is for you. <laughs> it is, and unfortunately, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not I'm not familiar with what the current plans are. Bob, are you? I understand that right now uh, it's not being considered. I don't think we have enough uh, empirical data. I mean, the GCBM model has a below ground component, but it's mostly live and dead tree roots uh, versus uh, herbaceous root material. So that's all I know. Anybody else? No. Okay, good question, Randy. We don't know. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to pop down to Angela. She says, how are Indigenous values incorporated in the burn plans? Go for it, Colleen. Oh, well, there's always the, um, because you want to, the consultation piece. So that's really important when you're doing your burn planning. And then it really, um, it, 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 it depends on the goals and where you're burning. If, if they are or desire to become part of the burn plan and its objectives. However, Indigenous uh, <clears throat> consultation is part of the burning burn plan process. Okay. All right. So I just have an eye on the time. I know that a number of you have one o'clock uh, commitment. So we have a number of great questions, but I think I'm just going to ask one more, unfortunately. Um, so this question comes from Tom. Is there any hope that given the scale and application of prescribed fire that we will significantly in, uh, reduce wildfire emissions on a provincial scale? It's entirely possible i mean carly you know dealt with this a little bit that um, we can see empirically through analysis that that um it's possible to do it um the whether we have the current we don't have the current capacity in bc we have to it, it just significantly increase capacity to do it it is feasible to do i'll put it that way um anyone else want to add to that I'll just quickly add that I think that, yeah, things need to, the scale of um, burning would need to be increased greatly um, in order to do that. And again, like you said, Bob, it's not to say that that's not possible, but it's gonna take a, a big change in capacity um, to meet that objective. We do know from landscape analysis, patch scale analysis and process and patch scale analysis that the, the indigenous steward landscape just didn't deliver the size and severity of fires that we're seeing now and that we'll see in the future. Um, so severity is, is equated to consumption. So if we if we know that, that we didn't have that scale of fires and that scale of high severity fires with the associated consumption, we didn't have the emissions. So what we have to do is we have to look seriously at that landscape that was stewarded by indigenous people before colonization and look seriously at that as a template. Okay, yeah, I see. Um, okay, well, fabulous. Thank you to all four of you. Um, and thanks to everybody for your attendance. I just have to quickly do some, some wrap up gratitudes and um, share a little bit about what's coming up next. So hopefully you can see my slide now. Um, of course, this is the time where I thank your, our speakers for their time, for their collaboration, um, and, and, and volunteering themselves to share this work with us. Um, thanks also 
of course, to KCP for your partnership on this project. Um, and thank you to the Columbia Basin Trust for your financial support and also to KCP's core funders. Um, what I'd like to do now is just highlight the talk coming up next, which ties in beautifully with our, with our just you know, recent comments and questions. Um, we'll be welcoming, uh, where am I seeing here? Next week, we'll have the opportunity to delve deeper into cultural burning. And we'll be welcoming Joel, uh, Joe Gilchrist, who will represent the work of the Salish Firekeeper Society, doing some really interesting work that I'm sure we'd all like to hear um, a lot more about. So that takes place next week, same time, same day, uh, March 2nd, noon Pacific time. And um, you can connect with me for details. Uh, you can register via the webpage. You can find it at cmiae.org. And um, yeah, I hope you're enjoying the series. We're partway, we're, we're making our way through now, building, building a big story. So thanks everyone for your time. Um, have a really great afternoon. <laughs>